Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon, and I'm the Dean of Graduate Studies at Charles Darwin University. Welcome to Outrider 15. Supervise yourself. That's a surprise, eh? This one comes via request from a student that obviously, probably, wishes to remain anonymous. She is confronting challenges with her supervisor right near the end of her candidature. Her supervisor is one of those light touch supervisors and she asked me if even this late in a candidature she should change her supervisor. Right, so I'm going to suggest that she doesn't. There are many reasons to change a supervisor and there can be success in that late change supervision. I've done a lot of those but what I would say to you is as follows. Do not think that this is an easy option. Do not think that there is a saviour or a white knight that's going to rescue you. You're going to have to rescue yourself. Yes, without a doubt, the great supervisors make a huge difference in your life and in your research career. Full stop. But at a certain point, colleagues, it's your thesis. Yep. It's your thesis. And remember, I am speaking from pretty deep personal experience here. I completed my PhD in two years, and I had three examiners, and all three, the greatest scholars in the world at that time, passed that thesis with three ones. So that is straight through without correction. Finished it in two years. One of those two years, I was working full time in another country. And the supervision in that first year was dreadful, and the supervision in the second year was non-existent. And in fact, the supervisor wouldn't even sign off the forms so I could progress to examination. So there's one data point. <laughs> Let me give you four more data points. Uh, I've also completed four master's degrees. Not one of those supervisors were involved in helping with research design, suggesting any reading doing any drafting or editing or commentary of any kind. Okay, so we have five data points in one human being. But remember, these five data points come from multiple times, because I'm impossibly old, multiple times, multiple disciplines, and multiple universities. So I'm not looking at you today going, oh, well, you're going to have to supervise yourself. But, you know, I had a fantastic experience. I had a dreadful experience. So today we're going to walk together through this and I am going to help you to supervise yourself so you can finish. OK, and we need to be honest about this. OK, let's just get the foundation in place. Your supervisor maybe just not there, just non-existent. Your supervisor may have retired, may have been restructured out of the organisation. Your supervisor may be so busy that they haven't even got time to go to the toilet, let alone read any of your work. So we need to accept that reality. That's real. That's reality. What are you going to do about it? What am I going to do about it? Together, let's do something. We've got 10 scenarios. Let's do it one. Firstly, do a time and motion study of your days and of your weeks. PhD students are time poor, I get that, and there's this endless worry that they're not going to finish in time. And of course, that's why so many supervisions and candidates blow out to these impossible length of time, years upon years upon years. And of course, complaints emerge from students that supervisors have not provided timely feedback or indeed any feedback. Therefore, okay, and that may be true, but you need to be honest about yourself and how you are spending your time. How often are you on Insta? How often are you on Instagram? How often are you shoe shopping on ASOS or Shine? Are you cruising for cake decorating ideas on Pinterest and you don't even cook. So be honest with yourself, colleagues. Look at your social media use. How many hours are you playing Death Road to Canada? Be really honest about that. So before you judge how other people are spending their time, look in the mirror. Seriously, look in the mirror. 
So for this final stage of the candidature, you need to Mary Kondo your life. You need to declutter your life. You need to give yourself five tasks to complete every single day and you need to complete them. Now, Instagram will still be there when you're finished. Trust me. So when we're talking about these late stages of the thesis, we have to talk about Joma rather than FOMA. So it's not the fear of missing out, it's the joy of missing out, knowing that for the final three, six months, say no to just about everything, to be frank. Joy of missing out. You're finishing a thesis. Tell people, I am finishing a thesis. I'm a bit busy. So know that you're going to miss out. Know that everything's going to be there when you finish, but you are committed to the finish. You are committed to the finish. As Tonya Dalton has shown, we only have three resources in our life. Time, energy, and focus. How brilliant is that? So productivity emerges from predictable and stable systems. So simplify your routines. Work out what's important. Know what's important. Know what you can control and get on with it. Two, be stronger than your excuses. This is a big one for me. This is my mantra every day, if I'm honest. It's been my mantra since I was 18 years old. Tara, be stronger than your excuses. Come on. Come on. Now, that mantra has allowed me to survive. And I've survived 10 universities in four countries. I've survived brutalizing, bullying and abuse beyond what you can humanly imagine. And I'm still here. And I'm here because I'm stronger than my excuses. There are tens of thousands of times in my life where I could have given up, where I could have just been destroyed, but I made different decisions. And colleagues, I'll be honest with you, there have been hundreds of days in my life when my alarm's gone off at 2 a.m. in the morning and I've laid in bed and I've said you know what I'd prefer to be dead than living the day I'm about to have to live and that's happened hundreds of times in my life but success is built when we transcend the lies we transcend the fear and yes, we transcend the despair. You see, what happens is we transcend the excuses and we make decisions. Excuses are easy, they're easy. So start to monitor your language, start to monitor your self-talk. Listen to yourself and watch yourself. Are you hitting the snooze on that alarm? Are you not even setting an alarm? Are you not exercising? Are you delaying making the difficult decisions in your life and candidature? So monitor yourself for a couple of days and really see if you are speaking in excuses. If you are, then this week, just make one decision for me. Be stronger than your excuses. The students that I find most difficult to help as Dean, and I've helped tens of thousands of students around the world, but the students I find most difficult to help are the ones that cover themselves with almost cotton wool of excuses. And when they've covered themselves in that cotton wool, they focus completely on what all these other people should be doing. Should, should, should. Actually, if you're supervising yourself, if you're getting on with it, you need to strip that cotton wool away. You need to look in the mirror and be honest. What do you see? What are you doing? How are you speaking to yourself? Three, are you self-motivated? Now, one of the reasons I think students focus so strongly on supervisors, and I understand this completely, is that students have this intense critique of what's going on with their supervisors because they are lacking self-confidence and they are lacking motivation. Do you need other people to validate you? 
Do you need other people to give you motivation? And I'm being really honest with you this week, the hardest students that I manage on a daily basis are the ones that arrive in my office going, Tara, I'm lacking motivation. I just have dropped in so you can motivate me. And I'm sort of thinking, wow, are we there? Are we there? So start to be self-actualized and disconnect your view of yourself from the opinions of others. So center yourself, focus on your goals, your strengths, your weaknesses, and yes, your motivations. Now, what I can tell you as an old lady, a really old lady, is if I'd waited through my career for somebody to help me, if I'd waited through my career for someone to say something nice to me, for someone to validate me, for someone to say, oh, what a good job you've been doing, I would have died waiting for that, okay? But you see, that's not enough. I think with all the focus on motivation at the moment, we're forgetting that motivation without a change in behavior is irrelevant. Work hard, commit deeply, enact productive patterns and back yourself. You see, it's your responsibility every day to create a productive pattern of work. Do not rely on a supervisor to push you. The students, I know that are in trouble and are going to be in trouble are the ones that are completely hooked into what their supervisor thinks of them. You must be self-motivated. And as I said, motivation means nothing if it doesn't change your behavior. So watch yourself every day. Watch how you spend every 30 minutes of your day. Evaluate your motivation levels and evaluate how you are spending your time. All I ask is that you make good decisions. It's all it's about, waking up in the morning and making good decisions. Now I know that's challenging in itself. Most of us grew up with Oprah, and we've had all these weird gurus moving through popular culture. You know, the wonderful uh, Professor Brené Brown, who is a wonderful human being, but still Brené Brown, uh, Dr. Phil, <laughs> Dr. Oz, Tony Robbins, and of course, yes, Jordan Peterson. Now, this is all about the self-help movement. And the self-help movement emerged through Samuel Smiles' work in the 19th century. He wrote the book called Self-Help. This book was directed at working class men to help them better themselves. Well, supposedly. This is a book, self-help, about working hard about self-sacrifice. And this self-sacrifice was actually without any real benefit for the individual that was sacrificing. You see, this book emerged during the Industrial Revolution in the United Kingdom. And remember, the Industrial Revolution created a horror movie of sickness, of despair, of overcrowding, maternal mortality rates, and early death. Great. And you see, the Industrial Revolution was killing people. And there were a series of movements at the time where working class people gathered together to try and create a revolution, to say, I don't want to die just to be in work. And the Chartist movement is a great example of that. But what happened was, as a countervailing movement, all these sort of posh critics started to write these books explaining to working class men in particular about why they just needed to suffer. <laughs> and why they just needed to get on with it, knowing that like they'll work hard and then they'll die. And these books include Matthew Arnold's Culture and Anarchy, what a title that is, published in 1869, and of course Samuel Smiles' Self-Help, published in 1859. And remember the radicalism of this time. We've got Marx and Engels writing the Communist Manifesto in 1848. Charles Darwin's Origin of Species was written, not published, but written in 1859. So you can see how these really radical books on the right and the left cluster in this 20-year period. The self-help crew that we're living with today, the group I call the Believe and Achievers, they offer really simple answers to very complicated questions, just like this group did in the 19th century. So the Believe and Achievers 
want you to believe that you can do anything, no matter what context or injustice exists around you. If you work hard enough, you will be successful. And that's the mantra most of us have grown up with. But the problem is, that's wrong. It's not true. There are millions, hell, billions of people on this earth who work incredibly hard and never receive 1% of the success and the acknowledgement and the money that they deserve from what they do for the planet. I'm thinking nurses, I'm thinking midwives, I'm thinking teachers, I'm thinking the crew that build our infrastructure. These people are remarkable and they're some of the most underpaid people in our culture. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't believe in yourself. I'm not saying, you know what, don't work hard. <laughs> I'm saying the exact opposite. You need to believe in yourself, yes, and you need to work hard. But the economic system around you is volatile, brutalizing, catastrophic, and often pointless. And you're going to have to compete very, very hard with a lot of people every single day just to make a living. So you as an individual, you're not free to succeed. You have to just work harder. You're not free to succeed. And remember, there are people who are basing their entire careers on trying to convince you if you can just work hard enough, you'll succeed, right? But the truth is, there's so little in our life that we can actually control. And that's why, colleagues, in the parts of our lives that we do have some control, we have to work incredibly hard. We have to control what we can control. And remember, there are no winners in the game of life. We're all dead at the end. <laughs> We're not going to win through this game of life. None of us get out of life alive. So make each day count. Four. Professional development services and library services are the key to your future. Here we go. If you're supervising yourself, you need to assemble a panel of experts around you to help you. Librarians are key. Make sure you go to librarians frequently. We have wonderful librarians at Charles Darwin University. They are superb, helping students one-on-one -on -one to write, to work with systematic reviews. They are amazing inspirational people. So enroll in courses from librarians, learn from librarians. Librarians are the experts in information management in this supposedly post-information age. So go to the experts who can teach you software and hardware. Go to statisticians to check and verify your quant. If you're needing emotional support, then please, just about every university on the planet, including mine, have these fantastic colleagues that work on mental well-being and also work with counselling. Your supervisor is not a counsellor. Your supervisor is not a social worker, unless they are a social worker. Instead, create a team to enable your success. Enroll in professional development programs, yes, in your university, but also beyond your university. Short and long-term programs are available from LinkedIn, from Udemy, from FutureLearn. And just once a week, take one course. A lot of the LinkedIn learning courses are one hour. Make sure you find one hour of your week and learn something. This freshens you up. It broadens you out. It widens your horizons. Yes, that's a cliche, but it's a cliche for a reason. Gain new insights gain new information from a diversity of sources and platforms and people. Learn something. Get beyond yourself. Know what you know, know what you don't know, and start to learn from other people. And this is how you supervise yourself. You bring information into yourself and you learn. Five, create a team of peer support. Some of the best students I've ever worked with, looking at Dr. Leanne McRae, some of the best students I've ever worked with create a cohort or create a team around them. And they care for each other and they move together into success 
incredibly inspirational. Now, digitization has given us lots of gifts. I think the most important one is deterritorialization. So we can find our crew, we can find our people around the world, and we can walk to success together. So read widely, follow great scholars on Twitter or X, or whatever's next, and build new relationships beyond your lab, and yes, beyond your university. And one of the reasons, for example, we decided at CDU to have digital office, office hours and right club is so that there would be this fantastic context around people so that we would learn and grow together. And those sessions have been recorded and you can see that happening before your very eyes. Incredible. Six, crucial. Be thankful for any support that you do receive. Complaint culture is the sinkhole of graduate education. When students get together and they complain about their supervisor, they lose time, they lose energy, they lose motivation. It is a sinkhole. Now, I'm not talking about supervisors who bully, who sexually assault or sexually harass their students, rip off their students' work. We have policy and procedures that can engage and manage that behaviour pretty well immediately now. So that's not what I'm talking about. These behaviours must be reported immediately and we have policies and procedures to handle them very, very quickly. Instead, I'm talking about the very, very busy supervisor, overworked, exhausted, probably fighting for their own career and life. And when a PhD student complains that they're not getting the time they deserve, it is, please remember this, very important to remember how sick our universities are at the moment. They are sick. Academics, we are trying to protect you as students from the most grotesque excesses of this time. But know this time is difficult for everybody, so please show some compassion, show some kindness, and try to move your language from complaint to consideration, from grievance to gratitude. Watch your languaging of reality. So let me give you one example of how incredibly volatile this situation is. So when you're about to go, ah, remember this, this is a true story from one of my former universities. A full professor, outstanding grants, multi-million dollar grants, so many publications, 11 current PhD students, was restructured out of the institution. No warning, one day everything was going fine, next day he got his restructuring letter. No reason, no rationale, except a couple of people in the senior leadership probably didn't like him too much. So he moved from a full professor to out of the organisation in six weeks, just before Christmas. And of course, all his 11 PhD students had to find new supervisors. And I know so much about the situation because I was one of those supervisors. Now I tell you this story because I understand that you're worried about your thesis. I'm worried about your thesis too. We're worried about your thesis. But most academics around the world right now are frightened that they're not going to even be in work in a month's time. Therefore, I know you are suffering. I know that. I know that you are feeling neglected. But realise all the things that may be happening in the background. Your supervisor may have a sense they're about to be restructured out of the organisation, they're going to have to sell their house, particularly in a regional area, they're going to have to sell their house at a multiple loss, it won't even discharge their mortgage, we know all of this stuff, and they may be, and of course you know I'm doing this now, as academics we are living relatively permanently away from our family and friends. So this is not FIFO, this is fee. <laughs> Fly in and you're just away from people. That's the reality. So, I know all of us crave protection and safety and security. And our culture is really geared to organize these long-term commitments. 
commitments to romantic partnerships in the long term, raising kids, paying off a mortgage, going to work every day for 40 years, and then after you've gone to work every day for 40 years, then you retire and or die. So this is the life narrative that has been naturalized and normalized in our culture. Now, I think I was so fortunate, and the reason I've probably survived is I didn't have this middle class narrative that was configured for me by my parents. My wonderful parents married in 1950 and they're still married and they're still alive. It's fantastic. But so they had that that was very stable, but everything else really wasn't. So they lived in 26 different houses <laughs> in 40 years, <laughs> 26 houses in 40 years, multiple jobs. Kevin was a professional gambler for three years, and for three years, he was a bookie's dog. For those of you that don't know what a bookie's dog is, the bookie's dog carries the money for the bookie. Yes, that's a job. So as you can see, life was pretty unstable for them, and hell, it was probably a bit of an adventure. And what is these days, I think, called a side hustle was basically Doris and Kevin's life plan. <laughs> So what I learned from them in my primary socialization is life is unstable, it's unpredictable, it's volatile, people will kick you if they can. And therefore what I learned is every one of us has to be sort of agile and robust to even survive, <laughs> to even survive. So that's my primary socialization. I've told you that story, so you think about your primary socialization. What were the stories told to you about success and failure? Did you expect, do you expect a particular life narrative to emerge for you? So like, do you expect a life partner? Well, just under half, relation, half of relationships end in divorce. Do you expect stable housing? Um, this is not the time for stable housing. Rents are impossibly high. You, there's no real way to move from these high rents to remotely saving for a deposit for a house. So there's a profound housing crisis in this country and in multiple nations. But also this notion that we're in a, in a stable long-term job that pays well. And I think COVID demonstrated the lie of that particular story. So what I'm suggesting to you is start to think about the expectations you had and have of your life and put a reality check against them and then make good decisions from that point. Seven, crucial one, make small good decisions every day. Most of the students I see in my office you know, when a dean sees them, they are completely overwhelmed, completely overwhelmed. And when we are overwhelmed, when any of us is, are overwhelmed, we, we, in that state, we can't make good decisions because everything is just too much. And I understand that. So what I get these incredibly overwhelmed students to do, and I do it in my own life, is, okay, everything's a shambles. And it probably is a shambles, right? That's accurate. It's a shambles. So what I get the students to do is pick one small task, put a, put a spelling checker through that chapter, check three or four references, look at one page or write one page. A strategy I often use to help really overwhelm students is I want you to write me 250 words today and tomorrow write me 250 words. No more than that, 250 words. And you know what? You can finish a thesis 250 words at a time. So make one small good decision. It's all I need you to do. And this hint comes from Brittany Burgunder, a remarkable woman who was able to save herself and has saved probably tens of thousands of other people on an eating disorder journey. And she stated, there are types of bravery and courage that cannot be seen. It's a bravery that you have to choose for yourself. You use it a little when you have seemingly small, insignificant choices and decisions that you make every day. You keep making these tiny good choices over and over 
until you realize that your entire life is different and the hero who saved you is yourself. End of quote. Changed my life, that. These are powerful words to manage eating disorders, obviously, but it's actually a powerful way to manage a PhD, make one good decision. Powerful way to manage your life, to be frank. I often hear people talk about something about being insta-worthy, right? So something's big. And we see through, particularly through all sorts of social media platforms, people with these big events in their lives. And we sort of forget the, the fact that we go, oh, I haven't got anything that's big. You don't need big. You need small, clear decisions every day. That's how you get to success. The most courageous thing that any of us can do on any day is wake up and make a decision. That's all I'm asking you to do. The problem, I think, is that PhD students want the big success. You know, the big proof, the fantastic three data points. Woo, woo, woo. Or, you know, some qual interviews that are just brilliant. We all want the big win. But research is not like that, and a PhD is not like that, and life is not like that. The definition of courage for me every day is getting out of bed, knowing it's going to be tough, and getting out of bed anyway. But still, you make a decision to get up, make incremental decisions, make incremental choices to move yourself forward. So if you keep showing up, and making these small decisions every day, you will create momentum. At its most basic, persistence creates achievement. On a personal note, can I say, when people say, you know, well, you know I don't think I have been successful, but if people say, what, you know, what, what's created success in your life? There's only one thing, and that is persistence. That is showing up. A lot of really, really dreadful stuff has happened in my working life, my professional life, my personal life. And any success that I've gained has not come from mentoring or networking or patronage. Any success I have has come from showing up. Even when it's tough, showing up. Eight. Hold yourself accountable. I understand why students complain about supervisors. I do. Because a student has lost control of that situation or their project. And they feel like they've lost control of their lives. I get that. You're frightened. And when any of us are frightened, our first reaction is to blame other people. But this also means, sadly, that you've released power. The moment you create a blame narrative then you've released power from yourself and you've given your supervisor power over your life. It is really important to sit in the power that it is your thesis. It is your thesis. And so therefore your understanding of progress and momentum is incredibly important. So map and track your goals. This is about your progress, not progress that is imposed by others. Use milestones. We're about to implement a full milestone program at CDU. And the reason that you're using milestones is you've got external assessors beyond your supervisors who are helping you work out how is this going, what can we do to help you. So you've got that group to help you succeed. But remember, every comment and critique you receive must be filtered to you via your goals. You're not living other people's goals, you're living your own. So hold yourself accountable. Do not release your power. If you want to move beyond multiple definitions of mediocrity, and remember most of us live in mediocrity most of the time, for me there are really two strategies. The first is focus and the second is consistency. Focus and consistency. Those singular strategies will create change in your life. So if you show up, if you focus on a task, 
then you will not be mediocre because you're doing something that the bulk of the population are not doing. But if you're unreliable, if you demonstrate the inconsistency of a telly tubby when the tubby custard runs out, then you're just not going to succeed. Nine, are you operating in a fear of failure rather than a fear of success? This is a new one for me as, as someone who has been a dean and worked in universities through the pandemic and beyond it. It's the fear of failure that I think's increased in the last five years. You see, so much of our culture is currently organised around avoiding somebody attacking you or bullying you and just sort of avoiding, hiding away from what's going on in life because it's so brutalising. I understand that. It's a fear of failure. And I get it. The problem is that when you have a fear of failure, it means that you're so cautious and just so careful that we actually sort of end up doing nothing because we're endlessly wondering what other people are thinking of us. <laughs> now, I get the fear of failure, but the problem is the fear of failure then leads you into the vortex of mediocrity so that you're not really striving and you're not really trying. So I understand what the problem is and I understand why particularly now this problem exists in PhD students. But what I would say to you, if we can name this fear of failure, then we can manage it. The best way to hook yourself out of this fear of failure is to replace one word with another. Very simple strategy, works incredibly well. So whenever you even mentally have the word failure appear in your life, replace it with feedback. Failure to feedback. No failure, feedback. Now it is emotionally dreadful to talk about failures. I get that. But what if we take the emotion out Let's just make a decision to do this. And whenever there's discussion of failure, we hear feedback. When failure hits you in your PhD or your professional life or your personal life, failure, 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 hear feedback, feedback, feedback. Failure is tough, feedback is important, and mediocrity emerges when we treat feedback like failure. Excellence emerges when we treat failure like feedback. So please remember, this university system doesn't want you to be successful. This system wants the people in power to remain in power. Universities are gatekeepers, they create insiders, and they create outsiders. And if you come from a working class background, you are an Indigenous student, a student of colour, a student with an impairment or a disability, an older student, or indeed even a woman. And you'll notice there, I've probably just listed the overwhelming majority of the world's population. But still, that's the point. You see, the universities were not constructed, are not constructed, to enable your success. This system wants you to fit in, produce acceptable teaching and research that is fitting for national priorities and what funders require at a particular time. Excellence is different. It requires that you move beyond the acceptable. So you're going to receive a lot of feedback in your life. You probably are right now. And you may be reading and hearing that as failure. But all I ask you to do is persist. Just keep showing up for me, okay? And you may not be acceptable in this system, but you may just change it. 10. Move your mind furniture and ask different questions. We all have some very damaging questions that we ask ourselves that come out of despair and come out of fear. You know, why is this happening to me? Why did he say that? Why did this person do this to me? Why has my supervisor just walked away? Remember, it's happened to me five times. <laughs> okay, so these questions are drenched 
in emotion, in sadness, in fear, and in worry. But the problem is, even if we can answer those questions, <laughs> the answers are not productive to us. You know, why did he walk away? Any answer you have is not going to help you get up the next morning and make a good decision. So think about the sort of answers that you're giving when you're asking yourself that question. I'm not good enough. She doesn't like me. He doesn't like me. No one cares about me. I can't tell you how often in the office someone says to me, no one cares about me. And it's like they're in my office and I'm caring for them and they say no one's caring for me. Okay. So these are not productive questions and they're not productive answers. So the best strategy to move your mind furniture is to understand and actually speak what you are frightened of and be really clear and then go, okay, I'm frightened of that. Log it, confirm it, but then just simply commit to the process. The thing about a PhD is it's pretty straightforward, to be honest. Most people that finish a PhD pass. People don't realize that. So if you just keep showing up, if you keep persisting, you'll pass. Because the PhD is a series of small decisions every single day. And that personal commitment to be present in the present detaches yourself from what other people think of you. If you just show up, you're not too bothered about what other people are saying about you. And also it starts to assemble productive boundaries, personally and professionally. So when we appreciate the gift of being present in the present, it enables emotional regulation, optimism, energy, listening, empathy, and yes, success. You can do this, you will do this, and you are doing this. I wish you love, light, and peace. Tea out.